keeping trusting ever good to gather with you for our biblical thinking event. If you are a TVC kid and you are planning to go downstairs with Miss Jamie for TVC Kids Create, you can meet her at this door and walk downstairs with her. Kids are now dismissed. We are so looking forward to getting started with our conversation. I wanted to give you all a few housekeeping announcements, and the first thing I'd like to do is welcome those who are maybe here with us for the first time or those who are joining us online. We are so glad that you have decided to be here with us tonight for this wonderful formative conversation with Dr. Brian Rosner. Um, I want to also highlight um, a couple of events that we already have scheduled for biblical thinking coming up in October as we prepare ourselves to head into an election season. We will be having biblical thinking. Um, we've got a slide for this, I think, Ryan, that is the antidote to outrage with Ke Trevin Wax. He is going to be here in person with us discussing uh, the subject, the antidote to outrage. And then in January, we are looking forward to welcoming Dr. Walt Mueller. He is going to be talking to us about God's plan for sex and gender, which is an event that we had scheduled for earlier this year and was postponed to January. So we're so looking forward to that. I hope you'll mark your calendars for those events. Um, I also wanted to point out that we have a resource book table out here in the lobby that's been provided by Logos Bookstore in Green Hills, and you can purchase Dr. Rosner's books there tonight if you wanted to pick up one of his books. Um, specifically, the one he'll be speaking on tonight is also available um, at the table. Um, another thing for resources, if you haven't already been to the villagechapel.com slash resources, this is our biblical resources library. We have curated um, books and articles and videos that are um, of in, would be of interest to you as you're thinking about all categories of life and thinking biblically about those things. So I encourage you go to the villagechapel.com slash resources to check out our resources library. It's a fantastic curated list of resources. And then and finally, I want to draw your attention to the screen to our QR code. This is for our live question and answer time with Dr. Rosner. I will say that I don't know that we're going to see this QR code again tonight because we'll be seeing a large... Um, a beautiful picture of Dr. Rosner's face as he talks to us. So you might scan the QR code now, and then as questions come up, you can send those in for the Q&A. If you forget to scan that QR code, you can go to villagechapel.com slash QA and also fill out that form there. So those are all the housekeeping things I have for you. There's coffee in the back, and I'm going to welcome Pastor Jim to lead us tonight. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Awesome. All right. Excellent. Ah, well, so good to be together and, and uh, thank, thank you for uh, carving out the time uh, to be here. Brian Rosner is uh, principal of uh, Ridley College in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, so uh, here in America, if you were uh, asked to come to the principal's office, 
this is usually not a good thing. But, um, but you, can see, you can see Brian on the screen. I think you can. Can you see him? Yeah, let's put him up there. We're, we're being invited into the principal's office tonight. I'm excited about that because this time it's for a really good reason uh, to have this conversation with him. He previously taught at the uh, University of Aberdeen in Scotland and Moore Theological College in Sydney, Australia. Brian is the uh, author and or editor of over a dozen books, including, uh, let's see, I have a copy here of The Consolations of Theology, which I really like his chapter in there. It's on disappointment, actually, uh, through the story of the life of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I know many of you uh, are Bonhoeffer fans, and so that might be an interesting read for you along the way. Uh, we also uh, know that Brian has uh, written this book, Known by God, uh, A Biblical Theology of Personal Identity, and this is how we first got to know of uh, Brian's writings. Uh, Tim Keller, I think it was, that uh, had uh, mentioned this in a, in a teaching or a tape that I'd heard somewhere along the way, and I went and got it, and a bunch of us on staff have read Known by God and really do enjoy it. And then uh, the book that uh, Brian will be doing a little bit of a talk from, uh, How to Find Yourself, Why Looking Inward is Not the Answer. So that'll be the subject of tonight's uh, discussion. Brian is married to Natalie. They have four children. Um, Brian, welcome to this evening's biblical thinking program here at the Village Chapel in Nashville via Zoom. Uh, some of us are curious how, how many hours between us and you. We think it's 15 hours. What time do you have there? It's about what? Not, is it nine? It's nine o'clock tomorrow morning for you guys. Uh, <laughs> awesome. That's so good. Uh, it, it, some, of well, some of the questions may come in. They want to know who won some kind of a lottery and what the number was. Or they, they might be curious about some of that stuff. If we, if we are able to do, just get a little bit of a hint from you on some of the things to come in the, in the near future. That would be awesome. <laughs> but... Um, in addition to your uh, work as an author, uh, Brian, what are, what are some of the, your duties as principal of, of Ridley College? What, what would an average week include just generally? Uh, that's a good question, Jim. I think my main skill is juggling. So basically, <laughs> I get the blame and the credit for everything. Um, usually, uh, it's not my fault, and I, it certainly wasn't my fault that we did something well. Uh, look, I'm, I teach. I uh, I work with faculty and staff, so there's some management responsibilities. Thankfully, I have ex an excellent finance team and, and deputy principals. Mm. Uh, there's governance and stakeholder engagement and fundraising. Uh, and thankfully, they, they want me to be a scholar principal, as we might call it. So I've, I'm also engaged in, in writing and research. So good. So you're getting to interact with uh, some students and other, uh, some of your colleagues, as well as uh, be somebody who's in charge ultimately of pretty much everything that goes on. Uh, that's good. I'm sure that that, uh, that kind of balance is healthy for you. Well, uh, we'd love for you to just talk for a bit about how to find yourself. And uh, if, uh, if, if my memory serves me correctly, we're going to have uh, Brian talk for 25, 30 minutes or so, and then we're going to take some Q&A. So y'all listen carefully. He's easy to listen to uh, with that accent. I know he doesn't think he has an accent, but here we think he has, that he does have an accent, and we're, uh, we find it refreshing to listen to. So, Brian, tell us about how to find yourself, how the book came about, uh, and, and the basic thrust of the theme. Excellent. Uh, th uh, thanks so much, uh, Pastor Jim. It's, uh, it's a great privilege to be with you. I have been to, to uh, Nashville before. Several years ago, I was involved in a Bible translation project uh, with the Holman Christian Standard Bible and spent the week in Nashville. I uh, went to a baseball game, and every year I get to the States in November one way or another, uh, for some biblical studies uh, uh, conferences. So I hope I can keep you interested for the next 30 minutes. And, and as was said, perhaps my accent will help there. And I, I've let my beard grow as well to uh, keep you interested. <laughs> yes, so the, the book really started out uh, with a very personal direction. So I think it's fair to say to, to talk and write about personal identity is, is a personal topic. And I had a crisis of identity of sorts in the mid to late 90s. And then since then, two things have happened. One, one, I've spoken to lots of friends and people in different contexts who are also struggling with their identity, wondering who they really are. Um, that, that's been a big part of uh, my experience in the last 25 years. 
And then the other thing is there's something that's emerged in Western culture. So Australia and the US share culture in many respects. Uh, it's sometimes called expressive individualism. So I'll talk briefly about that. So Jim, you want me to just to launch in here for the next while? That's great, and and I'm I'm really I would love for you to do that. I've got so I've got some questions about 18 quotes I pulled from the book, but I I think you'll probably answer some of my questions, some of our questions, uh, as you just talk about the book uh, from the get go here. So yes, please go ahead, launch in. Go ahead, yeah, great, thanks. And as I said, look, it's a great pleasure and an honor privilege uh, to speak with you. And, and uh, I'm really grateful to hear that uh, my work's been of some encouragement, encouragement to the staff. Uh, yes, yeah, so the idea of expressive individualism is where I want to kick off. Um, and, and basically, it's this idea that you should look inward to find yourself. But certainly in our day, personal identity has become something of a hot topic. Uh, for, for example, Charles Taylor, who's an Amer uh, a Canadian philosopher, said, Modern freedom and autonomy centers us on ourselves, and the ideal of authenticity requires that we discover and articulate our own identity. So you've probably heard people say, be true to yourself, um, uh, uh, things like uh, be yourself, you do you is the most hip version, I think, that I've heard. Yeah. Uh, if you go to a, a college graduation, that's the kind of thing that the speaker will say, if you watch um, uh, daytime television, like an Oprah show, that, that's the sort of thing that will get a standing ovation. So authenticity is really at the heart of this notion. Just to give you a few more popular culture references, Will Smith said, nobody knows you but you. You can't get advice on what you should do with your life. Nobody knows what you are. Sometimes you don't even know who you are. So it's an interesting emphasis in our day. And it really is um, a recent trend in Western culture. There's, there's a way of checking this, uh, something called an n-gram search. You can, uh, um, uh, uh, you can do a search of all of English literature in the last several hundred years. And if you do that for things like personal identity, identity formation, you do you, um, uh, it's only in the last several decades there's been an exponential rise in, in that kind of topic. I saw Thor recently, the Marvel movie, uh, while I was on a plane, and even Thor's trying to figure out who he is. He said, I need to figure out exactly who I am. So it's not uh, limited to uh, us mere mortals, apparently. <laughs> uh, as I said, in, in our day, there's only one place to look to find yourself, and that's inward. And personal identity, in that sense, is really it's a do-it-yourself project. These days, we have a self-made self all forms of external authority are rejected. Your personal happiness is your ultimate priority. And uh, living in accordance with the identity that you identify uh, becomes uh, uh, how you live authentically. The roots of the movement are worth thinking about, but that's not really what my book is about. Um, I have a friend, uh, Carl Truman, who's written a couple of books on uh, the topic uh, he's really looking at the intellectual roots. Um, he's got a big book called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. It, it's really focused on sexuality and gender. My work's been uh, of a broader nature. I, I'm interested in those topics, but uh, I think the theme of personal identity goes much broader than them. Uh, and then he's got what I'd call The Idiot's Guide, uh, a much shorter book called Strange New World. And that's the one I enjoyed most, uh, if I was uh, being honest. So he, he traces these ideas to Sigmund Freud and the, the focus on sexuality, um, uh, a guy called Rousseau who uh, was very much about uh, the authentic individual being the individual pre the influence of society, th those kind of ideas. But I think technology, politics, culture, all sorts of things have led to um, uh, where we are today uh, with this notion of looking inward to find yourself. Now, the book does a pretty heavy critique of that and replaces it in many ways. So it's worth saying, though, that there are some benefits, of course, to looking inward. And, I, and, and when, when the book title came out, uh, the, the publisher chose the title and the publisher did the, the cover, of course. Uh, I wanted to call it um, How to Find Yourself, Why Looking Only Inward uh, is not the answer, but they took out the word only because they said it wouldn't sell as much. <laughs> Um, and, and just as a sidelight, the two things I had nothing to do with, namely the title and the cover, 
uh, so far have been the only things that the book's been awarded for. So it's a strange world. I'd say there are at least three benefits to looking inward to find yourself. Uh, the cover kind of tells that story because you get smaller and smaller as you look inward. Um, and, and just briefly, the three uh, benefits of looking inward to find yourself would be inclusion. So I think our society is uh, rightly recognising that certain identity markers, people uh, from uh, different cultural backgrounds and so on, have felt excluded and not recognised in society. So there's this uh, um, this uh, desire to see them given due recognition and acceptance. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, self-reflection, obviously, is a good thing. You need to know your own talents and gifts and, and you need to be self-aware about your own issues and problems, of course, as well. And then authenticity. Uh, of course, no one wants to be a phony, so uh, living your true self is obviously a good thing to do. Part of it is a reaction against a stereotypical view of the 1950s. Now, I don't want to offend anyone. I was born in the 1950s, 1959. I just snuck in there. But the 50s are this decade in many people's view of uh, life when it was kind of mechanical and uh, there's a lot of conformity um, and uh, suppression of people's real desires. And then we had the 1960s, the sexual revolution and the like. Uh, so in one sense, expressive individualism is a reaction to that, what I think probably is in part inaccurate view of the 1950s. So where to next? I think there are three problems with expressive individualism. They all start with F. So I'm from a Baptist background. I'm now an Anglican, as it turns out, so I like to alliterate when I can. So my three points are the self-made self, first of all, is fragile. So what I mean by that is uh, the kind of self it produces, it, 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 doesn't, um, it doesn't lead to a healthy and uh, solid and uh, satisfying sense of self. So I'll quote three doctors, uh, Dr. Francis Fukuyama, who's an American political scientist, he said that confusion over identity arises as a condition of living in the modern world. Uh, Dr. Kevin Van Hooser said the human race is suffering from a collective identity crisis. And then Dr. Taylor Swift. Yes, um, you, you heard me right. Dr. Taylor Swift, who got an honorary doctorate from New York University, recently said this. And I just love what she said. She said, we are so many things all the time. I know it can be overwhelming figuring out who to be. I have some good news. It's totally up to you. I also have some pretty terrifying news. It's totally up to you. So I think she hit the nail on the head. Uh, there's all this promise of freedom and satisfaction and happiness that this movement offers and uh, brings. But on the other hand, it, it's actually quite difficult to just look inward and find a satisfying and solid sense of self. I think social media has uh, played a part in this. I mean, social media gives us unprecedented opportunities for self-definition, doesn't it? You, 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 you can pick the profile pic and, and you give your own story just as you want to tell it on the various platforms. But uh, many studies have shown that excessive use can actually lead to an unhealthy thirst for approval and the validation of others. So instead of just looking inward, you look around to others to affirm who you are. And I confess, I know this myself, I put up a post about something and uh, obsessively look to how many likes I've got, compare myself with more popular friends. It, it's pretty lame in the end. Uh, now, I'm not against social media entirely, of course, there are some good uses to it. But I think as a way of defining yourself, of uh, finding yourself, it, it's fraught. So the self-made self is failing. Secondly, I think, excuse me, it's fragile. The second thing is it's failing. I think the self-made self is not leading to what we might call the good life. All of us want to lead the good life. And that notion goes back to the ancient world, as it turns out. So thinkers throughout the millennia have uh, pondered, what does it mean to live a good human life? And uh, I love what Francis Fukuyama says about looking inward on this score. He says, the problem is that the inner selves we are celebrating may be cruel, violent, narcissistic or dishonest, or they may simply be lazy and shallow. So the idea of looking inward and wanting everyone to celebrate what I find 
it, it, it's really uh, quite naive in the end. The Lord Jesus, of course, said, if you want to follow your heart, be careful because out of the heart come all sorts of things that are harmful to you and damaging to others. Uh, in the book, I come up with five tests. Again, they alliterate uh, the existential test, the egotism test, the ethics test, the enemy test, and the enjoyment test. And, and in each case, I think there are cultural trends which show that this this new movement's not leading to the good life. There's more there's more anxiety around. There's more depression. Sadly, um, uh, young people are less uh, content and confident about their futures. So just to break that down a bit, so we've got what's called the utopia complex. We're selling to young people this idea that if you just follow your dreams and work hard and uh, uh, look inward to find yourself. Life will be an ever upward journey. You'll achieve your goals. And unfortunately, of course, human experience says otherwise. None of us who've reached any kind of age uh, can say that our lives have gone uh, strictly according to plan. And uh, at my age, I look back at all of my peers. They've all had burdens and struggles that they did not anticipate and for which they were not prepared uh, the egotism test, I mean, there's more narcissism around. Uh, the ethics and enemy test, and we've got cancel culture and an outrage culture. It's just like you flick a switch and you go straight from being pleasant and happy to being totally outraged about one thing or another. And then finally, the enjoyment test. You, you'd think that expressive individualism would do really well on that test, wouldn't you? Because basically it's, it's, its single goal is personal happiness. Unfortunately, the reality is otherwise again, and uh, there are studies of happiness, not in the kind of flippant superficial sense, but uh, happiness in the sense of well-being and contentment with life. And uh, as it turns out, the happiness index is going down rather than up. People are less happy with their lives. I, I like to think of happiness as uh, more a subsidiary goal in life. So it's a bit like trying to get a good night's sleep. If you try really hard to get a good night's sleep, it's not going to work, is it? The way to get a good night's sleep is by doing other things. And I think happiness is like that. If you aim for personal happiness, you're very likely to miss it. Uh, and the way to happiness is uh, to do um, other things and to live in a different manner. So fragile, failing. The third and most important critique I would bring to just looking inward to find yourself is that it's faulty in the sense that human beings uh, are not um, self-made selves. We know ourselves by looking in three other directions. The first direction is around to our relationships. So we know ourselves by being known by people other than ourselves. Yep. And uh, uh, if you're married, uh, if you've got close friends, which I'm, uh, I hope you all do, you'll, you'll know that you, you'll learn about yourself by your interactions with others, by having your, your personality and identity reflected back to you. The second direction is backwards and forwards to your life story. I mean, our, story, our lives are stories, aren't they? So what connects me um, at my age to me as a baby? It's my story. And uh, that story uh, has defining moments, it's got various struggles, it's got goals and a destiny like any good story. We'll come back to both of those. The third direction is we need to look up to find ourselves. Now, um, Christians, of course, would say this, we need to look up uh, to God. Um, and, and many people in society would say, well, religion is in decline. Uh, but interestingly, most of the studies show that spirituality is not in decline people still are looking for something beyond themselves. And uh, there's a beautiful story about this from my home city in Sydney in Australia. Now, you may have seen the Harbour Bridge in Sydney. It's an iconic building. And uh, at the turn of the millennium, on the 1st of January 2000, Sydney has the best fireworks. And because of the time zone, it's the one of the first places in the world uh, to celebrate the new millennium. Bit of a backstory. There was a guy in the 1950s, an illiterate alcoholic by the name of Arthur Stace. He became a Christian at a church in Sydney when he heard a sermon on that odd verse in Ecclesiastes, God has put eternity in our hearts. So Arthur Stace became a Christian. He wanted to preach the gospel. 
But his only way of doing it was to write in chalk on all of the sidewalks, the pavements, some of the buildings around Sydney. Early, every, every morning he'd get up early and write eternity. And uh, this message was all over Sydney for decades. Now, back to the millennium. On the Harbour Bridge, you know what they wrote on the Harbour Bridge? They wrote eternity in his handwriting. And you know what? There wasn't a squeak of complaint. If we don't look up, if we take an atheist or agnostic worldview, then we should have written oblivion because that's all we're looking uh, forward to. So uh, the fact that eternity is up there, I think, speaks to this idea that in every human heart there's a longing for, for beauty, for justice, for a satisfying story to make sense of our existence. There's a repulsion of evil and death and, and I think they're, they're what Pascal calls the famous French Christian apologist, the reasons of the heart. So I think, friends, to find yourself, you need to look around to your relationships, back and forward to your story, and also up uh, to God. So the next question then is a little bit on the side. Does the Bible actually say anything about identity? The word identity is not in any translation of the Bible that I've seen. And as I was arguing earlier, personal identity has become a, a postmodern obsession and focus. It's only in recent decades that personal identity has become so important to us. So back in the late 90s, uh, being a, a biblical scholar, that's what I did. I, I basically had some doubts about who I was anymore, and I went back to the Bible to see what it would teach. And I found a bunch of things there that I think are just uh, beautiful and true that address our, our postmodern concerns in the most wonderful way. And it's one, of the, it's one of the reasons I think the Bible is inspired. It speaks across generations. It speaks across millennia and across cultures. So if you're in a culture where you're being persecuted, there's so much in the Bible that we barely notice. But we're in a culture obsessed with personal identity, and there's so much in the Bible there uh, to help us. So, for example, um, uh, Romans 12, 3 says, think about yourself with sober judgment. Isn't that amazing? So exactly our preoccupation in our world is, is given voice in Paul's letter to the Romans. <clears throat> you could actually put the word identity in the translations and I don't know what Pastor Jim will think of this, but I think principles are allowed to do this. So I would say in, when Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, your life is more than food and clothing, I would say your identity is more than food and clothing. The Lord Jesus said something so relevant to us. Our, our material possessions are not the thing that define us. And that's so often how we think about ourselves, isn't it? Um, and then Paul uh, in Galatians 3 says, in Christ Jesus, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. So some of those identity markers that are so important to us in our day, gender, ethnicity, uh, social status, uh, the Apostle Paul says, not that they're completely unimportant, but they're not all important. They're not the things that really define us. So, uh, I'm just looking at my time. Yep, 10 more minutes. It's all good. We're on track. I hope I've still got your attention. Can Maybe you could wave at me to prove that you're still listening. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so what do we do with those three directions? The interesting thing is that the, the third direction, looking up, has an impact on the other two directions. And that, that's where I want to land this little half hour. That's where I landed the book. So what do I mean by that? Well, we do have a social identity. Um, where uh, if you want an illustration, when I lived in Scotland, I loved the bird life. So occasionally I'd look up into the sky uh, in one of the seasons and you'd see geese in uh, V formation, honking geese. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that. It's a beautiful sight. They're, they're migrating. So I think in our day, we tend to think of ourselves as soaring eagles, eyeing our prey from a great height. Uh, uh, thinking that we can uh, live this, um, live the dream and live a story that we that we ourselves star in. The truth is, we're honking geese in a tight V formation. That's just how the human beings exist. 
We're social beings. We know ourselves by being known by others. And, and as any goose will tell you, it's the only way to fly because you get the uplift from being in unison and interdependence with other geese, or in this case, human beings. So uh, what's this got to do with looking up? When I went when in the late 90s, the thing that had driven me all my life was J.I. Packer's notion of knowing God. Yep, that's, a, that's such a great challenge. It removes the futility of life. Life has a purpose. But, but, but it didn't really help me in the midst of an identity crisis. What helped me was the other side of that relationship, namely that I'm known by God intimately and personally as his child. Now, I'm not talking about omniscience here, that God knows everyone at all times, that kind of thing, because he's everywhere. But, but the Bible talks about this personal knowledge. Some language distinguishes uh, distinguish those two types of knowledge. If you know German, there's a different word for knowing something and for knowing someone. And God knows his people personally and uh, intimately. And you get that from many parts of the Bible. Uh, one beautiful point is Galatians 4, where Paul says, formerly when you, when you didn't know God, now you do know God, but then he corrects himself, or rather you're known by God. And then at different points, Abraham, Moses, David, Jeremiah, Israel, and the church are all known intimately and personally by God. Uh, uh, Bonhoeffer's name was mentioned. I'll say briefly, one of my favourite uh, parts of Bonhoeffer's work is when he wrote from prison that amazing poem, Who Am I? I don't know if any of you know it. You could Google it later. It's an extraordinary piece. So basically in prison, he's wondering, who am I? You know, I, I walk out for my cell and everyone thinks I'm um, I'm supremely confident and content, but inside I'm longing for colours, for conversation, for freedom. And the last two lines, he repeats that question seven times, who am I? He says, who am I? Lonely questions mock me. Who I really am, you know me, I am yours. So this, this notion of belonging to God and uh, being known by God is what gave him great comfort. And then finally, the, the other direction that's so important for knowing yourself is about your story. So each of us lives stories that are both individual, they're family stories, they're national stories that got to do with perhaps with our class. Um, but Christians have a bigger story which undergirds all of them. And it's actually, it's very odd, but it's a beautiful thing. It's this idea that we live the story of Jesus Christ. So the defining moment of my, of my life is not something I did or do. It's that Christ died not just for me, but I died with him. There's a really intriguing idea that I think is sometimes neglected in evangelical circles. Surely the cross is where we find forgiveness. He dies in our place. But did you realize we also die with him? We die to self-interest and sin. And then our lives are characterized by that sacrificial love and service. And then one day when he's revealed, our true identities will be revealed. The, um, the classic text here, I think, is Colossians 3, 3 and 4 where the Apostle Paul says, and again, I've uh, fiddled with the translation to bring out uh, the point, you died, Paul says. Just think about that for a moment. You died, and your identity is hidden with Christ in God. Such a beautiful truth, friends. Uh, people get to the end of their lives. Uh, Alzheimer's, for example, is such a terrifying and terrible thing. Um, and uh, you wonder, who, who am I if I lose my memory? But my life, my identity is hidden with Christ, secure in God. And then Paul goes on to say, when Christ, who is your life story, appears, you will appear with him in glory. So the second coming of Christ is not just about uh, the revelation of the true identity of the Lord Jesus, but also the revelation of our true identities as his sons and daughters. Two more texts to show you just how much the Bible addresses these issues so helpfully. In our day, one of the worst heresies you can utter is that you don't belong to yourself. You belong to yourself. It, it, it's almost creedal in our society. You reject all external authority. It's understandable because uh, to belong to someone else sounds like 
a, uh, an excuse for that person to oppress you. But the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, something that'll uh, take your breath away. He says, you are not your own. Now, there are some contexts in our world where not being your own and belonging to someone else is a good thing. Imagine you're in a shopping mall and uh, a little girl, uh, two years old, gets lost. And they put over the loudspeaker, uh, could someone come and pick up little Mary? Uh, she's wearing a pink dress and polka dot shoes. And the mum turns up and says, she belongs to me. What does Mary say? Mary doesn't say, no, I don't. I belong to myself. No, Mary runs to her mother and embraces her. So in, in some context, especially in the context of a loving relationship, belonging to someone else is, is the height of human uh, happiness and contentment. Um, a marriage relationship is, is this is the same thing. Um, now, the reason you don't belong to yourself if you're a believer is what the rest of the verse says. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. The Lord Jesus uh, paid the ultimate price. Um, and we know that God loves us because of his death in our place and for us. So that's such a beautiful verse, isn't it? And then finally, the most stunning one, I think, in the Bible uh, for our day is what Jesus himself said. All four Gospels have this saying of Jesus, which um, addresses expressive individualism directly. Jesus said, whoever finds themselves will lose themselves, but whoever loses themselves for my sake will find themselves. Extraordinary thought, isn't it? So, uh, the Lord Jesus is saying to us in our day, if you're totally self-focused, if you think you can make yourself, if you want to live your own story, you will end up losing yourself. And uh, uh, there's a recent ad, I, I love this ad, so the Navy in Australia is trying to enlist new recruits. And the billboard says, live a story worth telling. Isn't that amazing? So you ask yourself, now in the Navy context, that you can see why they say that, uh, you know, you're serving others, you live an exciting adventure, uh, you'll learn new skills, and you'll have great stories to tell when you retire. So live a story worth telling is, it's almost a gospel invitation. It's saying to us, rather than living your own short story in which you're the star of the show in which you're the scriptwriter and the illustrator and the director, what the gospel offers us is to have a bit part in a much grander story. And having just a small part in God's grand story of redemption, living the life story of Jesus Christ, um, defined by our death with him and by our destiny of being revealed as God's children in the future, makes all the difference in the present. Now, it doesn't obliterate individual differences and particularities. So I'm still a father, I'm still a worker, I'm still a friend, I'm still a husband. But the kind of father, friend, husband and worker that I'm meant to be will be transformed, hopefully, by the story I'm living and by me de being defined by um, being known intimately and personally by God. Now, this new identity is not automatic. It's a gift, but we do need to put it on. And that's what Paul says in the rest of Colossians 3. He says, you've got to put on the new self, uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and live his story in the present. So many of the things we do at church are exactly this. Baptism is all about dying with Christ and rising with him. The Lord's Supper is about us identifying with him so closely uh, that we uh, uh, remember his death as our own death. Um, uh, we, we sing of a new future. Uh, we hear God's word preached and read uh, because it tells us not just about God, but about ourselves because the Bible is a mirror. So just to end off my part, friends, and I hope it's stimulated you enough to ask some good questions. Uh, the two verses to end with would be 1 Corinthians six nineteen: You are not your own. You were bought at a price. And uh, that famous saying of the Lord Jesus, I'm quoting Matthew 10, 39, Whoever finds themselves will lose themselves, but whoever loses themselves for my sake will find themselves. It's a beautiful promise at the end 
of uh, that verse, which uh, uh, gives us the encouragement and hope uh, to live not just for ourselves, uh, but for others, and in particular for Jesus himself. That's wonderful. Thank you, Brian. I uh, appreciate so much uh, that overview of the book. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Um, and I want to invite you all, uh, th- those of you that took a picture of the QR code, you can go ahead and start sending. I've got a few questions here, um, but uh, feel free to send in more if, uh, if something comes to mind. Um, Brian, if you don't mind, I'd love, uh, I-, I remember reading through uh, you, I, I believe you take, you take us all the way back to the book of Genesis, even the uh, Genesis chapter 3 and the fall of, of mankind, the entrance of sin into the world. And, and even I, I believe you suggested that, that we might even see sort of a foreshadowing of a expressive individualism there. Can you tie that together for our folk? We just studied Genesis uh, maybe a year or so ago, and I think that might be really refreshing for them to see how that connects. Yeah, great. Yes, I think, uh, I think you see that when you compare the temptation of Jesus. So basically both the temptation of Adam and Eve and the temptation of Jesus are about personal identity. I mean, it's clear in the uh, temptation of Jesus because um, the, uh, Satan uh, keeps saying to him, if you are the son of God. And so Jesus has at the heart of his temptation the question of what type of son of God is he? Is he God's well-pleasing and obedient son of God or not? Now, when you go back to the garden, you can see some parallels there because um, even though it's not explicitly said that Adam and Eve are children of God, that's the implication of a number of texts. And I think the image of God, among other things, has this at at the heart, that we are made in God's image as his children. So at the end of uh, the uh, genealogy in Luke 3, it says, Adam, the son of God. In Acts 17, Paul says, uh, we are God's children. The problem, of course, is that because we've sinned against God, we've fallen, that relationship with God is broken. And not only is the image of God marred, but our status as God's children is removed and we need to be adopted into his family again. So I think the kind of self-definition, self-assertion that we see in Adam and Eve's temptation, uh, the other side of that coin is uh, Jesus' obedience and submission uh, to the Father. That's great. So uh, I, I believe uh, I believe it's around uh, page 25 or 26, as I recall. Uh, you refer to a, another cultural icon. You you've quoted already tonight uh, that uh, theologian and scholar Taylor Swift. You also quoted you also quoted one of the most famous of all songs, and uh, I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, uh, seen or viewed on YouTube over uh, one and a half billion times. Can you just, uh, can you bring that, I, because part of, I think, what we all need to be equipped with is the ability to, uh, to, to not just sort of download the voices that want to shape and form us, and not just sort of, you know, without, without thinking, but become critical thinkers, to uh, borrow uh, Christopher Watkins' uh, book titled Biblical Critical Theory. That is, we want to be able to interpret our um, our world and the messages that are being presented to us, some of them in very, um, you know, stunning and beautiful and but yet very subtle ways. Uh, we, we, do you mind uh, refer? You know which one I'm talking about? The, yeah. I think so, yes. The, yeah, yes. So uh, in Frozen, the movie, yeah. uh, which I confess <laughs> I've never seen, um, so uh, my kids are a bit older than that when Frozen came out. Yeah. Um, you've yeah. got, is it Elsa? Is that her name? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. She, she has this song where she talks about uh, living to the beat of her own drum and <laughs> uh, the whole world will celebrate who she is. And uh, look, friends, on, on the surface of it, that sounds very attractive. <laughs> uh, but the reality is none of us, none of us live to the beat of our own drum. We're, we're social beings. Uh, there's so much evidence for this, uh, uh, and as it turns out, the social sciences, psychology, anthropology, uh, and so on, they define personhood in in social terms. They say that the, the self, so to speak, is a network of relationships. That, that's what a, a, a self is. There's an amazing story, actually, I read in a, a US newspaper some years ago about a fellow who, uh, Christopher Knight was his name, he wandered off into the wilderness 20-odd years later, he came out. He'd been completely isolated 
Uh, for all those years, he was stealing from cabins. They finally caught him. And uh, they interviewed him and said, you know, it must have been really great to be have that solitude, to look into yourself. And uh, I'll quote what he said. He said, I applied my increased perception to myself, but I lost my identity. Wow. So the idea that you can just live your own story and be the hero in your own story just, just doesn't work out in 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 practice. Yeah. So I think uh, as much as Frozen is a great movie, and most Disney movies these days, uh, they, they preach the same, the, the same message. Yeah. Uh, it's all about finding your true self and living authentically and uh, the world will be transformed. Um, and it's, it's a sad irony. Um, another, the, another way of putting that is uh, it's never been more important to know who you are, mm. but, but on the other hand, it's never been more difficult to know who you are, because we're so spoilt for choices yeah, yeah. in our day. How would we, How would we if we wanted to uh, come up with some kind of a structure for, for um, working on a biblical anthropology, something that, uh, you know, if, if we were going to take some of what you've said, and certainly some of what you say in the book there, uh, where would you begin? I mean, is it, is it back to the creature-creator distinction do we, do we get all the way back to that? Is that where we're kind of messing up in, in the world in which we live? Everybody's thinking they are their own little G-God. They are their own uh, creator, if you will. Are we blurring that line too much? Uh, Jim, I missed the middle part of your question, I'm afraid. You cut uh, out at my end. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just talk, talking about, I, I'm wondering if we've blurred the line between the creator and the creation. We, we are a part of the creation I'm wondering if that's at the root of our inability to, to, uh, to build, to find, and to maintain a biblical anthropology. Uh, if we wanted to start uh, in, you know, in an intentional kind of way uh, to do that, where would you suggest we begin? Well, I think the first place to go would be to read my book, Known by God. Yes. <laughs> but, but, but more seriously... Hold on, I let me hold that up to everybody. everybody. <laughs> yeah, well, more seriously, um, I, I, what you're talking about is effectively idolatry. The Bible has a lot to say about idolatry. Tim Keller, of course, uh, talked about uh, the idol factory that is the human heart. And, and really, idolatry is putting your trust in something, loving something inordinately, and serving something um, apart from God. So in a sense... Um, what you're talking about is um, the worship of the self. And I think the Bible's teaching of idolatry has this at its very heart. It's this notion, the problem with idols is two things. They make God jealous, a really uh, unusual notion in our day, but nothing arouses the jealousy of God more than worshipping uh, false idols. Mm. But the, the, the other side of that is that idols are gods that fail. They promise satisfaction. Uh, they promise fulfillment. Yeah. Um, in, in the ancient world, idols you went to for fertility, for healing, and they just don't come up with the goods. Yeah. So that's yeah. the tragedy of, uh, of idolatry. Uh, idols actually demean us and diminish us. Mm. And uh, um, worshipping the true and living God is, is actually good for human beings yeah. in the yeah. long run. We, we don't do it as, 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 a, as a way of becoming happy. That, that, that's just uh, silly. But aligning ourselves with God's purposes and worshipping the true and living God and, and putting to death idol, the idols that uh, can entrap us it is really a big part of uh, um, the moral renewal uh, process that all of us as Christians uh, uh, are part of and on that journey with. That's so good. Uh, several questions have, have come in, and some of these are kind of specific to someone's uh, family situation. But I, I think uh, a broader way to say uh, what some of these folks are asking would be, um, how, how could we best uh, begin to uh, talk with someone to, um, if we were hoping to lead them to more of a biblical anthropology, to be able to share the gospel with them, for instance, and to somebody who's caught up in a sort of self-obsession, struggling with their identity, um, uh, fixated on one particular category. And I, I remember when I was growing up, I mean, we, it, it was more workaholism. You were, 
you know, your identity was wrapped up in what you do. And, and that was the first question you would ask somebody when you met somebody for the first time. What do you do? You know, that kind of thing. And it, we just found our identity in that. And now it's moved on from that to the host of things that you've mentioned, including human sexuality and, uh, uh, and uh, political stuff and ethnicity, that sort of things. Th- those things, some of which are not in and of themselves bad, but they just weren't meant to be the center. How do we talk, though, without talk with folks about this kind of stuff, without sounding like the guy yelling, get off my lawn all the time as Christians, you know? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. Um, I, I think um, the, the Christian gospel is uh, one, of, one of its um, uh, most beautiful aspects is the fact that it contextualizes. Mm. So we have an unchanging message, but it can be expressed in different ways and different forms in, in a different uh, uh, culture and context. So I didn't say this, but, you know, the, the, the idea be true to yourself, uh, be who you are, you do you, I think Christian evangelists should play on that board and say, look, uh, that's a good idea, uh, but you should be true to your new self and you should do um, the new you. And, and really what we've got on offer, part of the offer of the gospel, the blessing of the gospel, is this stable and satisfying sense of self, this purpose in life, uh, this story we can be a part of. Uh, I think for those of us who are not um, uh, uh, equipped uh, evangelists, the main thing is to talk to people and ask them. Ask them what is their story, what's driving them, um, what, uh, what do they see as defining them. Yeah. And then you have... Uh, a possibility of sharing your own story. The Apostle Paul, of course, did this three times in Acts. He just tells his story. That, that's that's the way it works. So I think one of the benefits of postmodernism is this emphasis on uh, the personal story. So when you tell your story, you can say, well, I know it sounds odd, but the big thing that defines me is is Jesus dying and rising. And I died and, ri- I, I died and rose with him. Yeah. And, uh, um, and, and rather than... Uh, thinking I belong to myself, I, I belong to him. And I, f- I find that a really beautiful thing in my life. That yeah. that releases me from the desire to make my own mark and uh, mm-hmm. um, establish mm-hmm. my uh, um, reputation, all of those kind of things, uh, especially if you're an academic. That That's such a, per- a, 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 a temptation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of my favourite passages in the Gospel on this score is, is in Luke where Jesus sends out the seventy. And they come back and say to him, you know, we, we had a great time. We achieved all sorts of things. We cast out demons and healed the sick. And Jesus says, yeah, you, you're right. You guys are a bunch of high flyers. I saw Satan fall from heaven. Mm-hmm. But then he says, but don't rejoice in the fact uh, that you did these things. Rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't have to make my mark in life. Um, I'm not, uh, at least at the best of times, Um uh, uh, because uh, I already have my name written in heaven. I, I'm, I'm my my future is secure, and it's not an achievement. It's actually a gift. So I think um, the two tips I would have would be uh, to use the kind of thought forms and expressions that are part of expressive individualism, but to transform them, to baptize them, if you like. And the other thing is is just to be curious about other people's lives. So true. So true. And then so, yeah. that yeah. gives you uh, the scope uh, to tell your own story. And, and that, that earns you a hearing, if you like, uh, once, once you've uh, listened to others. I think your, your point about asking questions, listening, and uh, sort of uh, living your life as a non-anxious presence, uh, that, that makes others curious about you. Why are you so non-anxious? Why are you... Uh, why do you have this sort of free spirit about yourself and you're not all caught up in making sure it always comes back, this conversation always comes back to you? Um, that's, uh, I, those are the kinds of people I'm drawn to and I, I think others are as well. How about the, for the folks, um, a couple of questions here, about folks that um, uh, could be parents, could be family members uh, that, that know someone really well that uh, thinking this out like this is, is more difficult. Some folk... Um, uh, who uh, may not be able to understand the theological concepts or the philosophical concepts um, and, and may fall 
vulnerable to um, the input of the world around them or voices on the internet, that sort of thing. Are there ways that we can uh, help um, them to be able to uh, uh, find their new life in Christ as well? Something come to mind there? Yeah. Um, the, the, the strategy the Apostle Paul gives us for moral transformation is to have our minds renewed. So, we're, and, and psychologists will tell you this, you, you think in a certain way that leads to certain behaviours and feelings. So I don't think we can get around the fact that uh, Christian teaching is required uh, for moral transformation. However, it's a mistake to think that uh, the really nerdy smart people who can tell you chapter and verse in the Bible are necessarily the most mature. Uh, in Hebrews 5, I think it's chapter 5, verse 14, uh, the author says uh, that the mature are mature because they've used the truths they know. So some of the most mature believers in my life who've had a profound impact on me have not necessarily been academically smart or uh, intellectuals. Um, uh, when I went to church as a young man, uh, there was uh, a man who uh, made sure that all the newcomers were welcomed. And I think, humanly speaking, I wouldn't be sitting here today if, if he hadn't been there. His name was, we, we always do, all used to call him Uncle Eddie. And he, he was a, uh, a labourer. He, he wasn't particularly smart. So I don't think it's about being smart. Uh, maturity is about using the truths we know. And uh, now that's one of the warnings to teachers, of course, will we'll be judged uh, more strictly uh, because we, we know a lot of truth. Uh, so I think um, um, all of us uh, can make progress in our world. Uh, we want to resist uh, uh, falling into the mould of the world on these scores because it's ungodly and it's not for our good in the end. Yeah. And the way to do that, according to, uh, say, Romans 12, too, is to have our minds renewed, uh, which will transform our behaviour and prove that the will of God is actually uh, the best thing for each one of us and for all of us together. Mm. So good. So good. Uh, several years back, you may have read it, there was a book called A Nation of Victims. And it was all about sort of uh, victimhood becoming our central theme in our story as we, um, as we position ourselves socially, uh, as we um, uh, move into some of the demands we might make of our, our culture, our government, whatever it might be. So uh, what about, uh, one question someone's asking here is how do you how do you turn? How do you get out of that when you've found yourself in your victim status? Yep, that, that's a really good question. And in the book, I do deal with uh, two of the big stories that are alternatives to the narrative identity or, or story for Christians. Uh, one of them is secular materialism, the kind of story that there is no God and basically the one who dies with the most toys wins. And that the meaning of life is about uh, uh, material acquisition and, and uh, pleasure. Uh, but the other one is the what's sometimes called uh, the social justice narrative, which divides the world up into uh, uh, victims or the oppressed, their loyal allies, which are sometimes called the woke. I don't, I don't like that term, to be honest, because it, it's part of a culture war mentality. Yeah. And, but then you've got the oppressors. And the problem with that story is that, look, there's some truth to it. There are people who in our world who are oppressed and we want to be on the side of the oppressed. Right. But to view the world as if the only two problems are discrimination and prejudice mm -hmm. is simply naive. All, of, all human beings have evil in their hearts and uh, all of us have disordered and uh, sinful lives in one way or another. So I think um, the, 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 the way to deal with that is not to define yourself by um, your victim status, if you like, because it's not going to do you any good in the long run. Mm -hmm. And the Christian story is to be offered as an alternative to that story, where social justice is addressed, mm -hmm. but in terms of a much bigger vision. Yeah. So the Christian story in one sense is the bleakest because it says that all of us have the potential for evil, not just one group, but all of us. And it's also the brightest because we have an intervention from outside ourselves and um, we have a hope that uh, will lead to, as uh, the prophet Amos puts it, 
uh, righteousness flowing like a river. So it's it's a really difficult one, and and I sympathise with uh, people who are um, um, part of that movement because there is some legitimacy to it. But but in the end, I don't think it takes seriously uh, the the reality of the human condition. It doesn't take um, um, uh, the it it doesn't take um, seriously the idea that all of us um, are culpable. And uh, there are distinctive failings for every one of those three groups. Sure, the, the oppressors might be guilty of self-interest, but the, uh, the, the loyal allies are kind of guilty of groupthink and self-righteousness at times, and the victims mm-hmm. can be guilty of, of laziness and uh, um, um, uh, bitterness. So, yeah. it, look, all of us want our world to be transformed. Christians have always thought the way to do that is by uh, each individual hearing the gospel and being born again, and then by the community of God's people living in a way that's a sort of um, early reflection of the age to come, where we deal with injustice, where we have compassion on others, where we're not um, um, overly greedy and uh, um, um, ignoring of the of the difficulties in our world. And, and, and I'm hoping that the, the village church is, is, is that kind of community, now, no church I've been in is perfect, and I'm certainly not perfect, but but that's what we're aiming for. So a long answer to say that uh, for someone stuck in that victim narrative, that the answer is the gospel and the church. And uh, uh, but we've got to we've we've got to um, embody that gospel and church and live that gospel in ways that uh, are honouring to God and, and attractive to others. So helpful. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, your answer to all of these questions. I'll give you one last one that's, <clears throat> I think, pretty, that should be pretty simple for you. We want to honor your, your time, and we do appreciate you uh, 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 being with us and staying with us this long. This is just a, a simple question. With the popularity of pers- uh, personality typing, uh, they're wondering what you might think of things like Myers-Briggs, Enneagram, those sorts of things. Do you have comment on that? Um, I'm, I'm not personally um, into it a, a great deal, uh, but um, on occasion, just to give an anecdote, um, uh, when I took this job in Melbourne at, at Ridley, we had the leadership team each do a personality test and we had someone come in and tell us, this is probably how you're going to interact with each other. Look, I think self-awareness is a good thing, um, but I think my, my one kind of caveat or slight warning would be that focusing so much on myself, my own fulfilment, if, if you take that information and it helps you in your relationship with others, that's great. Uh, but if it becomes uh, such an obsessive focus that it's really about uh, all about your self-improvement and progress and uh, living the dream, then then uh, I'd, I'd probably warn against it to that extent. I think you're right on there. You, you mentioned Tim uh, Keller earlier, and uh, uh, several other folks here were watching the service uh, yesterday held in, uh, in Manhattan uh, as he's gone home to be with the Lord. But I, I, you can help me with this because I know you know the quote. Uh, but so, somewhere I believe he says something, don't think too highly of yourself, don't think too low of yourself. The whole point is, um, is, is not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself less. And I think he's quoting Lewis there. Uh, a little bit, or at least referencing Lewis there, but it, I, I think it sounds kind of like what you're saying here with these tests as well, not to be so fixated on the self. Well, there's uh, one of Tim Keller's books not many people know about. It's a little book. It's called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness, yeah. yes. and it's really riffing off uh, the Lord Jesus where he says, uh, those who find themselves will lose themselves. So, yes, The Freedom and Joy of Self-Forgetfulness or something like that. that that's the title. Okay. Yes, and Tim Keller... Um, yes, he, he talks about pride. Pride's not so much thinking um, too much of yourself, it's thinking too much about yourself. And, and humility is not thinking too lowly of yourself, it, it's uh, thinking of others. And, and yep. Paul says that, of course, in Philippians. He says that uh, um, after the example of Christ, we should put the interests of others ahead of ourselves. And uh, this is such a, a paradox, isn't it? But the truth is, uh, when we lose ourselves, we will actually uh, find ourselves um, anew and in 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 a real sense. 
That's so good. That's so good. Brian, thank you so much for being with us. Let's give uh, Brian Rosner a uh, warm, warm round of applause. Thank you so much, Brian. And um, uh, just a reminder, uh, uh, Brian, next time you're in, in the States and if you come to Nashville, I do hope you'll let us know, and, and we'd love to have you come here and, and uh, share with us once again, maybe in person. Um, a reminder to everybody about the books uh, out here available at this table. Cora will help you with those uh, as, uh, as you may uh, have some interest in these, these books. And again, this, this one in particular that we talked about tonight, How to Find Yourself While Looking Inward is Not the Answer, just a great read. I l- oh, by the way, for s- small groups and home groups, um, he's got, Brian has included some questions at the end of each chapter, and I think that makes a book like this even all the more helpful. Some of the questions that you might have sent in or might be thinking yourself are actually already in the book, and it helps to read the chapter together with some other folks. He's, he's mentioned the importance of community, uh, and I, I want to encourage uh, our smaller communities within our overall community. I want to encourage you to uh, take the book and perhaps use that Uh, in your home group. Thank you again, Brian, so much for being with us. Uh, We'll look forward to uh, chatting with you again in the near future. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks Thanks so much, much, everyone. everyone. God God bless. bless. Yeah. I think I'm doing that right. Let's see. Am I doing the technology there? Okay, I think I did that right. Sorry. Well, what a wonderful night, and I'm so grateful to uh, Brian, and uh, I do hope we get to have the chance to have him here in person sometime. Um, let's see, how do we want to close? Do we want to, do you want to stand and we'll sing our doxology? Would that be all right? And uh, do, anything I need to tell anybody that you can think of, anybody? I'm not forgetting anything. If you have questions, let me do say this uh, as your pastor and part of your pastoral team here at the Village Chapel. Um, if you have questions that are a little more specific on this particular subject, and you'd like to be able to chat with uh, one of the pastors here at the Village Chapel, we're happy to do that. I hope you'll shoot us an email, just info at the Village Chapel, and, and somebody will be glad to get back with you. Um, if, like me, you have some family members or some close friends um, who are struggling with identity issues, I um, want to in- really encourage uh, you to read this uh, book we were just talking about. First of all, that's a beginning place. Um, um, but at the same time, happy to also connect with you and pray with you about what's, whatever might be going on in your uh, family members or your friends' life. This is um, not going away. I think it's only going to become more complicated, more complex. And it's all the more important for us as a community to be a city on a hill, a light that cannot be hidden, um, where we understand the deep, deep longings of the human heart in this world. And as complicated as some people's lives may be, we actually want to care for those people. And we want to love them with uh, uh, the love of the Lord, and we want to point them to the gospel, uh, because it really, really is um, the answer to their deepest longing. It's belonging to the Lord and belonging to one another in a community like this. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. And um, I just pray for each and every one of us as... uh, Uh, We've been inspired. We've been informed. I pray that we've been encouraged as well. Um, I pray that you'd help each and every one of us uh, to be awake and aware of the, um, just the cacophony, uh, the noise around us that seeks to shape us, that seeks to um, in some way either deceive us or or cause us to be derailed in terms of our faith. Um, the voices that are sometimes beautiful, uh, sometimes well-sung or well-played, um, that would lead us to think uh, in, in, terms, in, in terms of some kind of idol uh, creation in our own life. And, and Lord, we don't want to do that. We want, we want to know that we belong to you. We want to walk with you. Um, we want to walk in humility before others and toward others. And uh, we want to be living out the gospel in word and deed um, because we know we live in a, in a dark world, in a hurting world, or in a broken world in many ways, but not a world without hope.
and amen. Thank you so much for coming. Hope you'll uh, take the time to connect with somebody else. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God. Go in peace.